Good morning, Word of Life. How are you today? Oh, come on. I hear a couple people in the front row are doing good. Anybody in the back doing okay? Okay, anybody in the balcony, you doing all right? All right, I see some, some friends in the balcony. Good to see you. Uh, I am excited to be here with you this morning. If you don't know me, my name is Brian. I am one of our youth pastors here at the Lakeland campus, and I have been on staff for, I think, right about four years now. I've grown up in this church since I was seven years old. Whoo, come on. You're like, how old are you now? Uh, I was here since I was seven, so I love Word of Life. I am so thankful I get to speak to you this morning. I'm excited about what God has put on my heart today to, to speak with you and share with you about. So I want to just jump into it, but before I do that, if you know me, if you've heard me preach, you've heard me speak before, you know there's two things I, I just got to do before I get into the message. Number one, my wife is here with me. Hey, babe. La bella Ana Natalia. I am so excited she's here with me. I know you're clapping. For me, it's really exciting because we got married um, December 4th, so yesterday we had our nine-month anniversary. Oh, come on. Woo! I mean, we're new at this. We just celebrate everything. Every day is a great day. Uh, I am excited that she's here with me. Also, I just want to honor our pastors, Pastor Joe and Miss Peppy. Can we just put our hands together for them this morning? Oh, man, I am so thankful and so honored to be able to, to be here and share with you this morning. Uh, if you were here last week, you know Pastor Joe was speaking about life groups and the importance of the people that are connected in our lives. I love how he started talking about not just how we all need an, a, a your faith, like a moment where God shows up to us personally, but there's also times in our lives when we need a, their faith. Like we need a group of people, a community around us to help us get from where we are to where God has called us to be. And I want to just continue in that flow today. Last week, we kind of talked about what life groups are. Today, I want to talk about what life groups are for. Okay, last week was what they are. This week, what they are for. So before we just jump into the word of God this morning, would you just take a moment and pray with me that God would speak to us individually? Come on, let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for your love, thank you for your grace, and thank you for your goodness. God, you are so good, and we are so thankful and honored that we get to know you. So Father, today we ask by your Holy Spirit that you would speak. Speak to each and every one of our hearts, because one word from you truly can change anything. So Father, we give you space, we focus in and we listen to your Holy Spirit today as you speak to us. Father, we love you and we pray it all in Jesus' name. And everybody say Oh, come on. I'm excited. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up. We're going to be in the book of Nehemiah today. We're going to be in Nehemiah chapter one, and we're going to read a couple of verses from here. Uh, and then we're just going to talk about it a little bit, see what God wants to say to us this morning. Nehemiah chapter one. Uh, being a youth pastor, it's very interesting to me how things have changed. Uh, for me, when I was growing up, the, the big deal was to bring your physical Bible to church. But now being in youth ministry, it's like, People, students aren't really bringing, they don't have physical Bibles that much anymore. They have their phones. If you got a phone, please feel free to swipe on over to your Bible app. We're in Nehemiah chapter one, and we're going to start reading from verse number one as well. It says, Nehemiah chapter one, verse one, the words of Nehemiah from Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, Nehemiah, listen, those who survived the exile and, and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, now, now before we move on with what Nehemiah is about to pray, I think it's very interesting that we just take a moment to just kind of see where he's at. 
Uh, and Nehemiah, has, his brother has just come to him and said, hey, listen, you know Jerusalem, the holy city, you know the place where, where you're from? You, you know Jerusalem, it's broken. The walls are broken down. The gates are burned with fire. And I can imagine Nehemiah in this moment when he hears that, that the holy city of God, the place where his ancestors are from, is, is broken. Is, the walls are, are broken down. The gates have been burned with fire. Essentially what this means is they have zero protection. They're in captivity. It's interesting if you think about it this way, where there are no boundaries, where there are no borders, there is always captivity. Maybe in your life, oh, come on, where there are no borders, where there are no boundaries, in areas of your life where you don't have walls set up as protection, you will find yourself eventually in captivity. And, and Nehemiah is in this moment and he hears that the walls are broken down. And, and it's not just something that, that he's like, oh, okay, no big deal. It says that he begins to, to weep. He, he's crying. He's mourning. He, he's frustrated. He's upset. He's trying to figure out how did this happen. He's in this moment where his emotions are starting to rise to where he can no longer control them. And he has to sit down. He begins to cry. He begins to mourn. He begins to pray. I don't know if you've ever been in a place like that before. Where you look at your life. You look at maybe people in your life. You look at some situations that you have been through. And, and it just makes you have to take a seat. And, and you sit down and you wonder, how in the world did we get here? Like, how in the world did this happen? Like, we weren't expecting this to happen. This hit us as a surprise. Like, I am so frustrated right now. I am so overwhelmed right now. I don't know what else to do. I can barely muster up the strength to pray. I don't know if you've had a moment like that before. If I'm honest, I know I have. Where it's like, God, it's taking everything out of me emotionally. Like this situation, this circumstance, what I am going through, God, it's taking everything out of me. But I love this one word. In Nehemiah 1, in verse number five, the first word, it says, then. Like, like, I know Nehemiah is going through this hard moment. I know Nehemiah is mourning. I know Nehemiah is crying. I know Nehemiah is praying. But then, like, like Nehemiah is in this place where he's frustrated, where he's emotionally charged, where things are really starting to affect him. But, but then, like I know Nehemiah is having this place where he's like, how in the world did we get here? How in the world are we going to fix this? But then... Like there's power in the then. Like, I don't know, maybe somebody in here today needs a moment where you're looking at your life. You're saying, God, I don't know how I got here, but, but, but that was me then. And now I am stepping into something new. That for Nehemiah, he has this moment where, where, where this then shows up. Like, I know you were depressed, but then God showed up. Like, I know you were sad, but then God came to your rescue. I know you were mourning and crying and praying and wanting the situation to change, but then you realize God was good. And you said, no, 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 no. In the words of David, when my heart is overwhelmed, I'm going to go to the rock that's higher than I. Like a then moment. Like, I don't know about you, but I've needed then moments in my life. Like, I've needed moments where I'm looking at my situations, but then I remembered that God is still this same God. God is still good. He is still with me. And if I can just have a moment where I take my focus off my circumstance and put my focus on my creator, 
Oh, then something will change. Like then I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. It's interesting to me if you can change your focus, you can change your future. Nehemiah changed his focus. He said, you know what? Like, I know I'm going through all of this. I know I'm feeling all of this, but then. And let's continue reading to see what, what this then was for Nehemiah. In chapter one, verse number five. Then, oh, come on, everybody just say then. Yeah. Oh, come on, say it like you mean it. Say then. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Then, then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God. Oh, he's encouraging himself in the Lord. You see this? Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open. Uh, it's so interesting to me how Nehemiah prays. I, I look at my life and I'm like, maybe I should begin to pray like this. <laughs> Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. I love this prayer. Like, I absolutely love this prayer. Like, like Nehemiah, let me give you a little background about Nehemiah. Nehemiah, he was actually born into captivity. Like, like Nehemiah was born into captivity. His life, he doesn't know what, what this sense of freedom really is. He was born into captivity. Now, yes, we see that he never allowed his circumstances to affect what he could be or what he could do. We see that he rose in ranks, that he became the cupbearer of the king. Now, being the cupbearer of the king is a big deal. Like, if you don't understand this concept, you wouldn't really see this as a big deal. But this is a big deal. The cupbearer of the king is the person who has the cup that the king is going to drink from. So whenever somebody pours a drink for the king, the cupbearer is the one who receives it. And the cupbearer, what he does is he tastes it first. Now why? It's like, well, now, now why is he tasting the king's drink? Because if there's poison in that, he's the one that's going to let the king know. And his life is the one that's going to, to end. Like he, if you can't tell, this is a very important position. Like to be the cupbearer of the king essentially is this first line of defense. Nehemiah has risen in ranks and in position, and he is the cupbearer of the king. And he hears of the city of his ancestors. He hears of Jerusalem. He hears at Jerusalem, the walls are broken down. He hears that the city is now in captivity. He hears that the gates are burned and something within his heart just won't allow that to continue. Like, I find it so interesting that for Nehemiah, he was born in captivity. This means he's actually never seen the city of Jerusalem. He's never seen Jerusalem, yet in his heart when he hears about Jerusalem. He's never been there, but when he hears about it, 
He hears about the city of Jerusalem and something in his heart won't allow him to walk past what's going on in Jerusalem. But rather he rises up and says, Lord, and we see the prayer. Let your servant have success. Like, God, let me go do something about this. And God shows up in an amazing way where Nehemiah is able to go to the city of Jerusalem. And I encourage you to keep reading this story because it is incredible. That Nehemiah gets to Jerusalem and while he's in Jerusalem, he begins walking around and he sees the broken walls and he sees that the city truly is broken. And something in his heart won't allow him to keep walking past these walls like everything is okay. And he, and he calls a town meeting. He brings these people that were captive into community. And he says, hey guys, we've got to do something about this. And he sees that there's a problem and he steps up and says, I can't keep walking past these walls. Like we've got to do something about this. And you can see through the story of Nehemiah that God shows up faithfully and mightily and these walls get rebuilt and the glory of the Lord comes back to the city of Jerusalem. But it makes me wonder, like, what's your Jerusalem? You know what I mean? Like for Nehemiah, Jerusalem was the thing that was in his heart that he could no longer keep walking past and acting like everything was okay. Like, what's, what's your Jerusalem? Like, what's the thing in your heart? Maybe you've been walking past it. But every time you walk past it, you just know something in your heart is saying, I got to do something about this. Like, what is your Jerusalem? Maybe for you, it's underprivileged youth. And you keep walking past, and something in your heart is like, I just, I got to do something. Maybe for you, it's husbands. Like, you, you, you see these husbands that are in your life, and you're like, you know, like my heart just goes out to them. Like, I just got to do something. Like maybe for you, it's young girls who are growing up having identity issues and struggling with who they are. And every time you get around them, just something in your heart just rises up and says, I can't keep walking past this. Like what's your Jerusalem? Like what's the thing that every time you think about it, something in your heart just sparks? Like something from within is like, I, I got to do something. I may not know everything, but I got to do something. Like, what's your Jerusalem? I love how if you look through the Bible, you could ask this question over and over and over again and see how God used people who answered the question, what's my, this is my Jerusalem. You can look in the book of Luke, chapter 5. Why don't we go there, actually? Luke chapter 5. Pastor Joel talked about this last week. In the book of Luke chapter 5, we can see that that somebody's Jerusalem just showed up. In Luke chapter 5, verse number 17, let's read it together. It says, one day Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there and they had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men were carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up who, on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. This is incredible to me. These four guys, we don't know if they're actually friends. We don't know if they knew each other before this. We just know that there was four people. One day they were walking to go see Jesus. As they're walking to go see Jesus, they see a paralyzed man. Now, my question really is how many other people passed by the paralyzed man and never did anything about it? 
Like on their way to Jesus, I'm headed to the temple. I don't matter. I'm headed to see Jesus. Like how many people just walk past him? But apparently for these four men, something in their heart, it wouldn't allow them to just walk past this paralyzed man to get to Jesus when they knew if they could bring him to Jesus, he would be healed. So these four men, I see two things initially that they did. Number one, they agreed. Like it wasn't just one of them saying, I'm going to pick up this guy and try to take him to Jesus. But apparently all four of them came together and agreed because they had the same conviction. They said, I got this conviction in my heart. You got this conviction in your heart. Why don't we get together and pick up this man? The first thing they did is they agreed upon what they were going to do based on the convictions that were in their heart. Why did everybody else walk by? Maybe they just didn't have that same conviction. Why do you see youth the way that you see youth and wonder why nobody else sees youth that way too? Maybe because you're the one that has the conviction. Why do you see the young girls the way that you see the young girls, knowing that they need help, but rather it seems like nobody else cares? Maybe because you have the conviction. Why do you see the husbands the way you see the husbands? Like, why, don't, why, why doesn't everybody else see husbands this way? Maybe because God gave you the conviction. And these, these four men, they agreed and said, we all got the same conviction here, so why don't we pick up this man and take him to Jesus? The second thing I see they did is they worked. What? I don't know how heavy this man was. I don't know what kind of mat he was laying. I don't know if they had ropes. I have no clue how they carried him. We know he had a mat, and the mat went with him too. So apparently they figured out some way to carry this man with his mat to Jesus. They got to work. They agreed on what they wanted to do based on the convictions in their heart, and they worked until they saw, till they saw this man healed. Like, wouldn't it have been enough? Like, let's be honest. Wouldn't this have been enough if they just brought the man to where Jesus was? Like, what if they just brought him to the house where Jesus was? Like, I don't know. I don't know. If, if I'm honest, I look at that and I'm like, probably, that's probably enough. Like, at least they got him closer, right? Nobody did anything. At least he's a little bit closer. Hey, God, hey, we're going to go inside. We're going to talk to Jesus. When he finishes, we'll see if he can come back out. Right? Like, I, they did something. But that wasn't enough for them. They didn't stop. They continued to work until they saw the thing in their heart realized that they worked. They picked this man up, brought him to where Jesus was. The house was full. They said, nothing is going to stop us. They get on top of the roof. I'm not sure how stable these roofs are at this point, but apparently they're pretty good. <laughs> but then again, pretty bad. How easily were they able to like open the roof? I have no clue. <laughs> They open this roof up, put this man before Jesus. Jesus says, I see their faith. I see their faith. And by their faith, you are healed. It makes me wonder, what's your Jerusalem? Like for them, it was this paralyzed man. For Nehemiah, it was the walls. What's yours? And what would happen... If like Nehemiah, you came together with a community of people to rebuild those walls. Like, what would happen if you like these four men came together in a community and agreed on what you wanted to do and worked until you saw it done? For Nehemiah, he saw the walls be rebuilt and the glory of the Lord come back to the city of Jerusalem. For these four men, they saw a man healed. What would happen if you, based on the convictions in your heart, based on your Jerusalem, found other people, got into agreement on what you wanted to accomplish and worked until you saw that thing done? Like, what are life groups for? That's what life groups are for. Right? Like this is a place where you get to come together with other people based on the conviction you have in your heart to agree and say we are going to do something about this situation that we see and we are going to work until we see it completed. Like that's what life groups are all about. Bringing life. It's, it's so incredible to me that, that when God... <laughs> 
right? When he created the beginning, right? The, the, the earth, Adam and Eve, we see Adam and the first thing God says is, it's not good for man to be alone. And how often do we try to prove God wrong? No, God, I can do it. God, I promise I can do it on my own. I don't need no help. How often are we trying to prove God wrong? And God would still say the same thing. It's not good. <laughs> like, how much longer do you think the people would have kept walking past the broken walls if Nehemiah never showed up? I have no idea. But apparently they did it for years. And they probably would have kept doing it over and over again, never fixing the walls. But somebody showed up with a conviction in their heart, gathered together a community, and what was once captivity turned it into a community where the glory of God came back. Like these four men, they got together. They saw this man who was in captivity, who was paralyzed, who was captive. And they turned that captivity into community. You, I, I bet, like, like I, I think about this, like, like really, just think about this moment where, where the four men, they pick up this guy, they bring him to Jesus, the man gets healed. Who's the first people he going to? Probably not Jesus. He's probably going to run up on the roof to find those guys and give them a hug. Why? Because they did something. Like they did something about his condition. How often do we just walk past Jerusalem and do nothing about the condition of the people that are living there? Like how often do we say, I got this conviction in my heart, but you know what? Like I'll try to do something. Like I don't need any accountability in doing this. Like I'm just going to try to do something. If it doesn't work, it's okay. Like God, I tried. And God honors the try. Pastor Joe always talks about that. But what if you tried a little harder? Like, what if we just tried a little harder? Like, what if we actually got some people together to try to pick up this man instead of me trying to lift this man by myself, getting discouraged because he's a little heavy and just going back to where Jesus is? Like, it just makes me wonder. Like, what if we, what if we got into community? I wonder. I wonder what Jackson would look like if a community of people got together and said, we're not going to keep walking past these broken walls. Rather, we're going to get together. We're going to do something about this. We are going to agree and we are going to work until we see it completed. Like, I wonder what young men and young women's lives would look like if we stopped walking past them and we said, you know what? I'm going to bring some people together. We are going to get in agreement upon what we're doing and we are going to work until we see it completed. Like, I wonder what marriages would look like. Oh, come on, somebody. Like, if a group of people got together and said, I know y'all are struggling in y'all's marriage. Come on over here. We're going to help you get back on the right track. Like, I wonder what God could do through you. That, that life groups are all about taking captivity and turning it into community. Like having a then moment, a moment where, where they were once captive, but then you showed up with a group of friends and you brought them into community. Like that's what it's all about. And I love how in this story of Nehemiah, if you continue to read, you'll see that they get to this place in chapter eight. Well, we quote this verse all the time, but I find it so interesting where, where in chapter eight, Nehemiah says this phrase, is quoted all the time. And if I started, I just imagine that you will know what it is. It says, the joy of the Lord is my? Oh, see, see, you know it. You got it. Y'all read y'all's Bible. Pastor Joe would say, who's your pastor? But I'm not him. So, uh, <laughs> the joy of the Lord, it is my? That's right. And I think about this verse, I've heard it so many times, and Honestly, when I hear it, it encourages me, right? Because it's easy to see this verse and say, you know what? Like, God's got joy, and his joy, if I could get it on the inside of me, <laughs> it will help me, right? It will do something for me. Like, I don't know, maybe you've heard it before. Like, this joy that God, one of the fruit of the Spirit, right? Joy. Like, God's got this joy. If I can get this joy on the inside of me, it's going to help me accomplish what God has called me to do. And I agree. But I also see that there's, 
another perspective you could take when you read that scripture. That the joy of the Lord. What if it wasn't about God giving me joy? And what if it was about me doing something to bring joy to God? Like his joy. Like when I do things that bring him joy. Like when I walk the path that he has called me to walk on, it brings him joy. Like when I get into this group, this community to see captivity turned into community, it gives him joy. Like what if I looked at it that way? It said his joy. Like when I do things that bring joy to the father, you know what I get? I get strength to keep doing it. (laughs) Like, you know how strong I am? I'm the strongest you'll ever see me when I know that the path that I am walking on is bringing joy to my heavenly father. I am strong then. Like, I am strong when I know that I am doing what God has called me to do. That's when I receive some strength. Like, to bring him joy. Oh, you talk about strength. Whoo. When I do what he's called me to do. Oh, I'm strong then. See, I guess you could sum all of this up with that one question. What's your Jerusalem? Like, what is the thing that's in your heart? I know oftentimes we look at our lives and it's like, I got a busy life. There is a lot going on. And I agree. Life can get busy. There are a lot of things that are going on. But I also see where when I do things that bring joy to the Lord, he gives me more strength to keep doing them. And and I would just ask you, what's your Jerusalem? Have you been walking past it? Like, Like, have you seen it? Has it done something in your heart, but you keep walking past it? Like, what what's Jerusalem for you? Maybe it's childhood obesity. I don't know. Like, what is it for you? Maybe it's the homeless. Maybe it's marriages. Maybe it's young men. Maybe it's young women. Maybe it's athletes. Like, what is your Jerusalem? And what would happen if you were to find some people, get an agreement on what you wanted to see accomplished based on the convictions in your own hearts, And then start working to see that thing done. Like, I imagine we see a lot of walls rebuilt. (laughs) I imagine we see a lot more people be brought to Jesus. What is Jerusalem for you? I I think that, that this idea of then, of like, Nehemiah was one way, then. Like he had some things going on in his life then. Like he was struggling, but then. See, these then moments, they can only happen when you know who God is. Like you can't have a then moment because nothing is going to change. You can't have a then moment without Jesus. He is the then. Did you see Nehemiah? It said he came to the Lord and then something happened. We, <laughs> we can't bring people to Jesus if we don't know who he is. We can't rebuild walls for the glory of the Lord if we haven't experienced the glory of the Lord ourselves. And while, yes, my question for you is, what's your Jerusalem? I think the overarching question is, do you know Jesus? Because if you know Jesus, he'll show you your Jerusalem. Like if you have a relationship with him, if you've given your life to him, like you will, you will then have a moment where he says, now I want you to do this. Like your relationship with Jesus is what gets you to your Jerusalem. What's your Jerusalem? The only way to get there is through Jesus. And maybe for you, maybe you're like, you know what? Like, I know I got Jerusalem in my heart, but yeah, I'm not trying to start a life group. (laughs) Then find one. 
Like find one, join in, be a part of one. And maybe you're like, I, I can't stop anymore. Like I've got to start something. Like I've got to go after this. I see this in my life. I can't keep walking past this Jerusalem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a life group. I'm going to find other people that got the same conviction. We are going to get in agreement. We're going to work till we see this thing completed. It could be as simple as having this conviction to pray. And I say simple, but that's honestly not simple at all. Prayer is so powerful. What if you got some people around you and just started praying on a weekly basis for something or someone specifically? Maybe you have one, a loved one, who's far from Christ. Maybe someone else has a loved one that's far from Christ. Maybe there's another person who's got a loved one that's far from Christ. What if you got together in a community and started praying until you see those people come to Jesus? Like, what's your Jerusalem? To get to Jerusalem, you got to go through Jesus. Because he is who shows you what your Jerusalem is, then, then, then you go out and you make the changes God has been calling you to make. And I just wanna pray for us today. So let's just bow our heads, let's close our eyes. If you're watching online, I'm gonna throw it over to Zach and Rafet, they're gonna close out service. But if you're here with us at the Lakeland campus, I would just ask you to bow your head, close your eyes. And let's just have a moment with God, maybe a then moment, a moment where we, we came in one way, but then God showed up. Like we came in frustrated, concerned, worried, but then we came to Jesus. Maybe for you today, You've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you feel like you've got something in your heart that you want to do. You're not really sure on it. Well, the way to Jerusalem is through Jesus. And maybe today for you, you want to give your life to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I give you everything. Like, Jesus, I know I'm not perfect. I know I've made mistakes. I know that I have sinned. But I am so grateful that you came for me, even in my sin, to die for me, to be, to be resurrected from the grave so that I could have a relationship with you. Maybe you wanna accept Jesus into your heart as Lord and savior of your life, or maybe you're just saying, you know what? I've been walking past Jerusalem for too long, and today I make a decision to say, no longer will I walk past Jerusalem, but rather today I will find some people, I will get into agreement, and we are going to work till we see these walls rebuilt. Maybe for you, you say, I want to accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior of my life, or maybe I just want to go and fight for Jerusalem. Wherever you are, with heads bowed, with eyes closed, on the count of three, just raise your hand wherever you are. One two, three. Say, yep, that's me. That's me. I need Jesus. I need his help to go and see the walls rebuilt in Jerusalem. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. You can put those hands down. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray and I invite each and every one of you to, to not just repeat this prayer after me, but truly to pray this prayer. You are talking to the creator of heaven and earth, you're not just repeating words, you are speaking to him. And so for you today, I would ask all of you, whether you raised your hand, didn't raise your hand, wanted to, but got a little nervous, like today, right now, in this moment, would you pray this prayer with me? Would you just mean it with all your heart? Would you say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Jesus, I know that I'm not perfect, that I have sinned and that I have fallen short of the glory of God. But I am so thankful that you 
came to die for me. I believe that you died for my sin. And on the third day, you rose again from the grave. Jesus, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. My past, it's gone. All things are made new right now in Jesus' name. And Jesus, I ask you for your help and for your strength to go and to fight, to see the walls of Jerusalem rebuilt. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, just put your hands together for everybody that made a decision this morning. Beautiful, 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 beautiful.